Finally, this event is being recorded. Um, so if you have your camera on uh, in this Zoom meeting, then you are consenting to have your face recorded. If you don't want your video to be recorded, you can just keep your camera off. Feel free to share questions uh, through the chat. Um, and we will not be saving the chat, so you can feel free to um, share ideas and thoughts that way without those being recorded. Uh, a couple of other details, if you would like to receive CTLE credit for this hour-long workshop, there will be a survey at the end. We'll share a link in the chat. You can fill that out to give us feedback on the workshop and also to share your information for getting CTLE credit. Again, use the chat throughout to share your questions and comments. We have everyone muted right now, uh, just to prevent any background noise on the recording. Um, but we would love to have you use the chat to share questions and comments as we go along and, and just ask that you use this discourse to be respectful and encouraging. All right, so I will start off by just um, introducing myself. I'm an educating librarian at the Center for Brooklyn History, and you can get in touch with us at any point uh, to learn about our school partnership program or to contact us for one-off class visits or archive tours and PDs like this one. Um, and we've been doing a lot of that, well, all of that virtually this year. So um, if virtual one-off class visits are something you are interested in, please let us know. May be interested in it after this workshop. You might be. Um, and now I will let Rachel introduce herself. I am Rachel Chapman. I have a background in STEM. I was a, a middle school and high school science teacher for almost a decade before I went and got my master's in library and information sciences. And I am a school librarian in the New York City Department of Education at a campus style school that serves grades six through 12. I also curate the uh, STEM CCD collection. Uh, so if you are here because of that, welcome. Um, STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And we will be um, referencing that frequently throughout. Uh, I also work part-time as a consultant for the Center for Brooklyn History, helping them put together STEM curriculum. Um, I call myself a wannabe archivist because I don't have any formal training in this, but I have been a, also a partner teacher uh, with Brooklyn Connections for a few years. Um, so we have a couple of questions for you. Hopefully you can um, answer these in the poll. The first question is, we would love to know where you are based, um, in New York City, in New York State, or maybe somewhere else, and you found us. Right, so it looks like we have mostly New York City, some somewhere else. I wonder if those folks are people who might live somewhere else and still work in New York City. Um, our next question is, what grade levels do you mostly work with? So it looks like we have mostly high school, a little bit of middle school, elementary school, and something else. And our last question is, what subject area do you teach? We should have put STEM on here. <laughs> I noticed a couple of people putting some links in the chat. I'm also gonna link our agenda, which has all of those um links embedded into it and we'll be referencing that throughout the presentation all right so we have mostly something else that's kind of cool great if you want to throw it in the chat what 
your something else is, we'd love to hear from you. All right. Science. That's awesome. <laughs> um, so the schedule for today, put the link in the chat and I'll put it again. Um, we are going to introduce the project packet of primary sources under the theme modern medicine in Brooklyn. We want to hear a little bit about your students and any research that you have done with them and talk to you about why we think primary sources are a great way uh, to teach. And we'll do a little bit of practice observations and inferences, short breakout session, five minutes to talk about just a quick uh, intro activity or model activity. And then we'll come back share out about those primary sources that are all included in the packet that's linked in the agenda. Um, and also if you registered, you should have gotten an email with that information as well. Um, and we wanna kind of finally finish out with some ways, some ideas that you could use primary sources in your classroom, something that you can take home and do this week or your next unit. Um, and then we'll connect to some books that I have curated um, on the Overdrive ebook collection, both Sora and also through the public library. So to start, um, I just want to share a little bit about where this project came from. Uh, so as I mentioned before, I um, responded to a posting looking for a STEM consultant for Brooklyn Connections. Uh, and I started last year um, diving into the Brooklyn collection, the archives, uh, local history archives in Brooklyn, looking for some sort of projects to connect to STEM. So as you can see on the left, this is a snapshot of the Brooklyn Connections resource page. There's a lot of project packets that are already there about society and culture, neighborhoods, places, and landmarks, but mostly geared towards ELA and social studies, the humanities. So we were looking for some projects related to Brooklyn that connected to the artifacts and documents in the Brooklyn collection. There, we already had one for um, environmental issues uh, and with the advent of the pandemic um, it I just started looking to see at the very beginning it was just a search for are there any pictures of people with masks are there any uh, articles that talk about the Spanish flu um, if you went to our last um, session it was interviewing Kenneth C. Davis, uh, who wrote a whole YA book about uh, lessons learned from the Spanish flu of 1918. Uh, and so that kind of spurred my interest in this. And as I researched, I found more information than just that time period, 1918. And we expanded it to include um, kind of from 1900 to the present. Um, how modern medicine has impacted Brooklyn and some of the, um, I guess, technological advances that happened here in Brooklyn. And we will get a chance to look through and share out um, all of, most of the documents that are in that packet. And again, the packet is linked on the agenda. Oops. So thinking about students and research, we have a few questions before we get started diving into um, the research. We want to know um, or about what you think your students know and what you are currently thinking about research. So we would love to hear from you in the chat um, or if you want to raise your hand um, and share out on the microphone. How do you believe that our students are currently constructing their knowledge? Is, do you believe it's from their teachers or do they construct it on their own? Um, and how would we want them to construct knowledge? So you can share in the chat. Yep, 
yeah, a combination of from their teachers and constructing it on their own. Um, I believe they use Wikipedia for research and a lot of Googling. I see a combination. They love their Chromebooks at school and computers and iPads at home. And hopefully they learn something from me, the teacher, while at school. And social media. And collaboration. collaboration. That's a great one. Yes, yeah, scaffolding and support. So hopefully uh, we will provide some ideas of how you could do some mini activities to scaffold and support. A lot of Googling. Um, Janice mentioned that a lot depends on the teacher. Uh, and I think it's, that's true. Both like Jenna said, the commitment of the teacher and my personal guess would be like the student's connection with the teacher impacts that. Oh, I like this. They start off by looking into something they're interested in and then asking teachers for extra support um, or hopefully we're motivating them through an assignment. That makes me think of, um, there was like a new image of the scientific method that um, had a, a, it wasn't so much like this, um, like linear progress, but more of like a, a cyclical nature. And one of the, the words that the kids always ask me, especially middle schoolers was what is serendipity? Um, and that that's something that they're looking for, or that something that just happens to um, spark their interest. Yeah. So along these same lines, what do we wish that our students knew about research? What do you wish that your students knew about research? Not to use Wikipedia. I'm gonna add why not to use Wikipedia. And I would, I would be that person who says or how to use Wikipedia properly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that they're going to be doing this, this research all of their life, literally all of their life when they decide where to um, move to, where they decide if they're going to purchase a car, or who to vote for, uh, to question what they read, that it's ongoing, that they can learn from this process how to critically assess a piece of material, that it can be fun. <laughs> oh man, paraphrasing. Jen and I have been talking about this all day, all week. Yeah, reliable and not reliable sources. Yeah, this is great. So um, the purpose of this workshop is really to talk about primary sources and why we believe that primary sources are such a great way to um, scaffold this and kind of get our students to know what we want them to know about research. Um, using primary sources in your classroom allows students to construct their own understanding and make meaning. Um, you don't have to give them all of the answers, especially we'll do this mini activity and model it and hopefully that can be something that you take with you to your classroom. Um, that they can help students practice these critical thinking skills. Um, like all of y'all are saying, research generating more questions, um, how to know that something is reliable or unreliable, how to evaluate a source for quality. So these are all like, having them practice this ha helps them practice those critical thinking skills. Um, it helps prepare students to be successful on database tasks. And I hate to use the word testing, but um, it really does help them be better evaluators of information in whatever setting that they will be in. Um, and we believe that teaching with primary sources is just an example of good teaching. Um, so I'm going to segue into our first activity um, that we're going to do together as a group. Um, and then we'll be in breakout groups real quickly. Whenever I hear breakout groups, I immediately like, I'm like, I'll leave and come back. So please don't leave and come back. <laughs> 
um, um, yeah, the breakout groups will be fun. We just wanted to dive into analyzing one primary source together, and you can share your thoughts in the chat. Um, but we'd just love to hear from you what you notice about this and what you wonder. Um, and that's all I'm going to say to start off with because I don't want to share any of the things I, I notice. I want to hear um, or see in the chat some things that you all notice. And mm, official document, perfect. Dates are not the same. Mm -mm. Interesting. It's a very good point. The dates are not the same. Down here, the vaccination performed and the date up here. It's a vaccine form. Uh, it's a certificate about 80 years old. Um, we wonder what this person is being vaccinated against. Um, notice this is a young kid. Um, this is age five years and wonder what the disease this was for. Um, we notice it's a medical document. Um, oh, I like this. We notice the word successful. Um, they're not giving out <laughs> certificates for unsuccessful vaccination. That's dark. Um, uh, I wonder how they determined whether or not a previous vaccine was successfully performed. Yeah. I notice these like, I mean, cause I'm just fascinated by, you know, bureaucracy. I notice these like form numbers and stuff at the bottom. Form 65K, 1937B. And I wonder what that means. Maybe there's significance, right? And that like it was approved in 1937 as a form and maybe K stands for Kings County, but I'm like inferring things. I'm going beyond the bounds of what I'm supposed to do right now. Um, I and, like this. Um the, it, somebody mentioned about a doctor, um, like if this was a doctor that performed, I mean, it looks like it says doctor or mister. I can't really tell. It says medical inspector. I wonder what that means. And um, Arlene wonders if there's a book that we can cross-reference the certificate number. And I really liked how um, we also had, where was this? Oh yeah, this point that it's certificate 1,117. So over a thousand people have gotten vaccinated, theoretically. Unless they started at number a thousand, but the, that would be too bad. Um, I found this in the ephemera folder mm -hmm. in the um, file cabinet. There's an address, yeah, showing up as a pinkish pale stamp under the words vaccination performed. The I think it's a mercantile mm, something, club, bank, um, on Flatbush Ave, 295 Flatbush, yeah. Um, Mmm, the dates aren't the same. I wonder if this is for a school registration. So connecting, making an inference based on age five years, they may be starting kindergarten. Yeah, above the address. Um, this is with 741 Halsey Street, the, the doctor's office or something else. So All right. Can I go to the next one? You can. Yeah. So uh, this was just this just came out actually um, last week. I think I saw it last week from the Smithsonian's collection. This is not from the Brooklyn Collect collection, but I just thought it would be interesting to reference. Um, you know, now that. When I found this original vaccination record, there were no, um, like I mentioned in the ephemera um, files, I didn't, there was no COVID vaccine yet. So 
I didn't know what a COVID vaccine was going to look like. So I just thought that it would be really interesting. Um, one way if you wanted to connect this with your students is something then and something now and making observations and inferences yeah. based on and, change over think, time. I think that's really powerful also because it reinforces that the, the things we have now are also historic artifacts. Um, but I love in the chat or already seeing some some responses about like what we notice and what we wonder about this one. Um, I mean, uh, mentioned that records are more detailed now and someone else it was also Arlene mentioned it's still handwritten um yeah um that's true and you got to hope that the person who writes your vaccine card has really legible handwriting um any other things that folks notice um this artifact um the dates are also significant regarding eligibility. Um. And I just wanted to mention, um, I use the word ephemera. Uh, I think, Jen, you did a lesson with my students a few years ago um, talking about ephemera and, it, and what stuck out to me in that definition is that it was not really meant to be saved, not really meant to go into an archive um, or, or, you know, we didn't think that a flyer or a poster is going to be saved long term. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really interesting that we already know, like the Smithsonian has already decided that this is going to become part of their collection um, and what, th what that means. All right. Um, so, I wanted to share uh, just one question before we go out into breakout rooms, but uh, when we look at primary sources, we also want to be thinking about how we're interacting or how we want our students to be interacting with this material and the tools that we can use. Um, and I would like to share, and I'm just going to put the link to the agenda again. Um, in the agenda, we have linked the Empire State Information Fluency Continuum, which provides a bunch of graphic organizers that we are going to share today, uh, but I, that you can take and use in your classroom. They are all Word documents and PDFs. You can edit them as you wish, and they are for um, either kindergarten, I think kindergarten all the way up to grade 12. Um, and I just want to give out a plug for Brooklyn Connections. I mentioned that I was a Brooklyn Connections partner teacher um, for a few years. And when you are a partner teacher, they will come and do workshops with your students. So I'm going to give the floor to Jen for a second to talk about that process. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I will mention we do um, usually have a partnership program um, that involves a lot of us coming into people's classrooms. Of course, all of that looks very different this year because uh, we're not we're not going into anyone's classrooms. Um, but we have been doing that online. It's a bit too late in the year for. Um, for folks to sign up for the partnership program now, but uh, we will share info about what get next year's partnership program will look like at some point um, towards the end of the school year. And you can find out about that by signing up for our email newsletter. So I'll actually see if one of my colleagues can throw the link to subscribe to that in the chat. Um, but generally with our, our school partnership program, we um, partner with a teacher to work with one to four of their classes. We come into the classroom four to six times to teach skills using primary sources. Um, we work with the teacher to look at a menu of skill-based lessons and figure out what those skills will be. But at the same time that we're learning skills, we're also looking at content. So we also work with the teacher to pick a Brooklyn history topic that we will dive into um, with all of the primary sources we look at and through a primary source packet like the one Rachel made on modern medicine in Brooklyn um, that all the students get copies of, they get to write in, it's full of DBQs. And so we um, 
we create a lot of lesson plans uh, for interacting with primary sources and building skills with primary sources. All of those are available on our website. Um, again, that's linked in the agenda, but we can put the, the uh, link in the chat as well. So those lesson plans are out there for you to use and adapt um, as much as the, uh, the other worksheets that we'll be looking at today um, in our workshop. And um, I saw Lee's question, um, can you join the partner? program if your school is in a different borough. Right now we only have the capacity to um, to work with Brooklyn schools unfortunately. Um, but folks from anywhere can can get in touch with us for accessing our free online resources and also um, when we are open in real life um, for coming to visit us and, and booking just like a one-off tour of the archive with us. Um, again those one-off tours of the archive are not happening right now. I apologize, um, but um, someday, someday soon. And so I see one more question. Do we work with District 75? Yeah, we do. Yeah. Um, last year, we just as a plug. Last year, um, Jen came and worked with a ICT class, ninth grade ICT social studies class. Yeah, we um, work with a lot of, yeah. yeah, like self-contained and ICT and gen ed and all, anything. We're happy to be there. Um, just to show you what um, the, will we say Empire State Influ Information Fluency Continuum, the IFC graphic organizers, um, I pulled one that we'll be looking at today, um, and this is gathering information through analysis of visuals. Um, at the bottom, you can see it says visual literacy 9-10.36. That means that this was um, ideally used for ninth and 10th graders. Uh, but all of the time I go back and pull ones from um, elementary school and middle school um, and adapt them. Like I said, they're all in Word format and you can change them as you wish. Um, so this is the one that we're looking at today and I use the like control find button on the on the website which is linked on the agenda. Um, I'll put it in here again. Uh, to find just all of the ones that deal with visuals. You can have them sort by um, you know all the visual literacy ones there's note taking there's uh evaluating sources all the different types of um when you think of uh digital literacy or information literacy so this is the one we're going to look at today um, and ideally if you worked with a student or students you would have them work either um, individually or in groups to kind of build this organizer out um, the way that we've set it up today is with a uh, Jamboard. Um, so if you look on the agenda or um, if you go to March 16th activity, oh, sorry, thank you. Um, you will see we're going to randomly uh, put folks in breakout groups. Um, each breakout group is assigned one Jamboard uh, with one or more documents from the project packet. Um, and on the second slide, I'll show you in a second, is that graphic organizer. If you forget, you do not have to write anything on there, but we would like you and your group to come up with one takeaway. Um, and then we'll have a conversation afterwards about how you could use something like this with your students. So if you have never used a Jamboard before, it looks like this. This is obviously the one we just looked at, um, but you'll notice at the top there are arrow keys to go to the next page. On the second page is that graphic organizer if you wanna re refer back to it. Again, you do not have to write anything on here if you don't want to. Um, but all of these tools on the left allow you to annotate your page. Um, and anyone, if the editing rights should be open to anyone with the link, if you have a problem, um, just send us a, a quick message. Um, we'll be going around to the different um, groups here 
in a second. Um, and Charlie, are you going to help us randomize? Yes, yeah, so I think Charlie will. So I just broadcasted the uh, the link again. Awesome. And this is five minutes. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to pause the recording real quick or edit this out after? Love to hear from um, all of the different groups. Uh, so hopefully, are we able to? Are people able to unmute themselves, Jen? Yeah, I'm gonna give folks the option to unmute and. Um, that's turned on now. Um, so as we go through group by group, if one person from each group wants to chime in and just, just share one thing, please, because we want to like leave time for every group to share, and there's 10. Uh, but we would love to hear something that stood out to you as you looked at um, the source and thought about analyzing it with the graphic organizer. One takeaway. One takeaway, yeah. And they are chronological. So someone from Hello. one? Yeah. Never mind. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, just that um, what are, you know, smallpox in Brooklyn in 1894 uh, being declared as an epidemic with uh, quarantine. So some of those words we know. And then this scary, like death, you know, with the scythe and mowing, ravaging Brooklyn, as somebody said. And the takeaway that we talked about was just then comparing it, comparing an article and uh, maybe a, a cartoon, if you could find it, of COVID-19 today and how it's being uh, put out in the press and media. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. That's a great takeaway. Yeah, we wanted to include a political cartoon in this project packet. So this was a, a pretty good one. Group two. And if you only want to put something in the chat, I'd be happy to share that too. Um, I can go. Um, we looked at the prescription and we recognized that um, you know, it's it's fairly legible by our standards. Um, and we sort of noticed that it includes the doctor's name and the pharmacist's name and a prescription, but not any information about the who it was prescribed to or for what purpose. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Group three, who unfortunately, I'm sorry about that your access issues. That was my fault. All right. Well, no worries. First off, number two, um, we explicitly saw through the picture, at least, that this was um, Red Cross nurses and they were rolling bandages. And considering that this was between 1914 and 1918, this, they might have been stationed in the States and this had to have been during the First World War. Yes, and this was actually from the Long Island Historical Society, which yes. I think is the same building that the... It is the Brooklyn Historical Society. It is the former name of the Brooklyn Historical Society, which is now part of us as the Center for Brooklyn History. Oh, wow. Thank you for, thank you for sharing. No. Group four. I liked this cartoon. So we... Um, we didn't have a lot of time, so we didn't put anything on the jam board. Sorry about that. Um, and we looked at this and we noticed that, um, it says about, um, sharing how he wanted to share his, um, you don't seem to have a handkerchief, so he wanted to share, but now because of COVID, um, everything is about not sharing and how we need to sanitize. So, um, 
um, I was thinking that um, how we um, in school were telling the kids um, um, that they have to have a separate um, folder, separate material, and all of that. So then it seems contradictory um, to this. But you see the faces of the um, of the people around, and they are shocked. And um, even um, now, um, everyone has different opinions, and um, so that's um, interesting. How even then. Yeah. There are differences of opinion. Um, it was very, I mentioned this earlier, it was very difficult to find things uh, documented about the Spanish flu. Um, and I asked Ken or somebody asked Ken Davis about this in our last um, workshop. And if you didn't catch that, it's on YouTube. Um, but there was like this collective amnesia about, uh, about the Spanish flu. And so this was like a very rare time where it was actually mentioned and it was actually like the hysteria um, around it was like, you can actually see that coming through in a document. So thanks for sharing. Group five. I can share. Um, we were, it was really, the audio was really bad um, in the room, but from what we, I could discern, we had a hard time making out the tuberculosis form, but the, the artifact on the left, we were talking about um, how they were grouped into like age groups. And as uh, the age increased, um, there were uh, classifications noted about marital status. Like first it was just single and married. And then widowed was included as um, the ages increased. And um, I'm not sure what else we talked about. I, we were trying to identify trends, but then, I don't know, I, I got kicked out super early. It was weird. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think, um, I like that you said trends. Uh, and I think if you are a science teacher, you understand how important graphical analysis is for our students. It's like the, being able to analyze a primary source is to ELA and social studies what analyzing a graph is to science classes. So it was really important that we find some sort of graphical representation. I love the one on the left is actually like hand drawn and so in an official document, um, whereas the one on the right is obviously digitized. Maybe a poor, I took a poor screenshot of it, but there's a higher quality image in the um, project packet. So this was tuberculosis um, on the right and influenza and pneumonia on the left. Someone from group six. Um, so we were at group six. So we noticed that um, it says Veroform leads world production of vital penicillin and it was Pfizer similar to what we have now obviously going on. Um, if you looked closely at the document on the right-hand side, the newspaper article read at the end, um, it said that it will be distributed to Americans as well as American allies, um, but initially starting off doses with essential personnel. So similar to what we're seeing today. Um, and then we have this like family products little kit, and we weren't sure if um, there was like penicillin in this kit or this was given afterwards um, and how this kit kind of came into play. Yeah, so this kit is a physical, I took this picture, a physical um, item in the collection. Um, and this is just some of the product, I guess it was like maybe their demo that they gave to pharmaceutical reps. But Pfizer was actually started here in Brooklyn, I think in 1936. I might be making that up. Um, but yeah, the, so this is something that happened here in Brooklyn. Um, and also just, this was a lot of information in one slide, but this, the, each of these in the project packet, each set of um, documents, uh, is linked to some follow-up questions that you could use. Group seven. I can go. Um, we looked at this picture and we were laughing about how it was like triggering our PTSD 
because they're online for a vaccination and they're standing so close. There's like not even a little bit of social distancing. And Arlene was like, don't they learn? Like this was 1941. We already lived through the Spanish flu. Come on, six feet apart. Nobody has masks on. And we wondered if they knew at that point that vi viruses and bacteria can spread through the air or not because it looks like maybe they didn't know, but then in 1918, they had masks, so maybe they did. I think that they did know, um, but I think that they were not, it was more preventative, I think, to get the vaccinations, I'm assuming. But that's a really good question. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to speed through the rest of these. Um, group eight. So another have image to, from have to be me. Um, I try to explain it to um, Sandra and um, what I guess is sticking out comparing um, this. Uh, I think this was uh, July 30th, 1954. The fact that it looks like she's holding some type of specimen, but there is no gloves on her. They are close to each other with no mask. Um, interesting that these are high school students that's being trained, unlike um, today where I guess CTE schools is somewhat a thing of the past. Hopefully they'll bring it back. But just reading, um, these were high school students in, in Brooklyn being trained for the summer to be a Red Cross volunteer. So very interesting. It just jumped in my mind um, when there was the executive order to have the nursing students graduate early because of the fact of um, COVID happening last year this time and seeing these students trained was different, so. Yeah, yeah I, I thought the same thing, um, Arlene, and I thought it looked kind of staged to me, um, but I thought it was really cool. Uh, yeah, the, the C I work at a CTE school, um, so yeah, I think that's, it's really cool to see these young people that, um, look like my students, um, you know, volunteering for something like this. Uh, group nine. I think this is. Uh, I'll go just, ahead and I okay. guess. If somebody also something. sent me a message too, I think for group nine. Oh, okay. Um, it says, it is apparent that the graph is showcasing the juxtaposition of various legislate, legislation, Vaccination Assistance Act, and medical um, achievements, water, chlorine, penicillin, and the Salk polio vaccine, and how their presence impacted the death rate of infectious disease. A decrease in rate is displayed um, across groups of two decades grouped at a time. The polio vaccine was also proudly lauded in the accompanying photo um, as a victory by the mayor who stated uh, it has licked polio dramatic at best, a foreshadowing of Governor Cuomo's daily press conferences during COVID. Um, and then another one I really um, love the images and the relevance of what we're dealing with. This was, um, so an audio transcript, an audio clip. Um, and then, um, you can see like when the, the vaccines, um, like cause causation and cause and effect in this graph. Um, and our last group was group 10. Hi. Um, since it's HIV and AIDS, um, at least two of us teach elementary school, and we thought that this was something that would not come up, especially in the younger grades. Um, we did notice that the cartoon, uh, that it has the character Freedy um, antibody, and that would be a good way to um, illustrate the immune system and uh, to help the students understand and to make it interesting. Uh, someone else talked about um, how students could draw their own political cartoon about modern medicine, um, you know, as it pertains to COVID. 
Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, and also you brought up a really great point. Um, not all of the documents that are in the project packet might connect to what it is that you are teaching. So there are actually 12 documents. There's one more picture of like a COVID, um, a playground sign. Um, and so you really have the option with these project packets to um, pick and choose the assignments that you want to do with your students. So um, many of you have already shared uh, some ideas of ways that you could use this, but you could do something like what we did as a bell ringer or a closing activity. Um, like I mentioned, each of these documents uh, in the project packet um, has like, I think three to five follow-up questions. You can assign those just straight from the packet as uh, an assignment or use those questions as your leading questions. Um, you can uh, use an image like what we've chatted about to supplement a mentor text. I did a blog post for Brooklyn Connections about picking a primary source that goes with a book set in Brooklyn. So for example, um, Rita Williams Garcia, uh, PSB 11 um, is set on Herkimer Street right down the road. Um, and there are some images that, like, I think I used a map maybe for that one, um, but just different things from the Brooklyn collection or from any primary source um, document to, to give your kids historical context to what it is that you're doing, whether it's science or English or social studies or art. Um, and then just to plug, if this is something really interesting, um, doing a research project um, or a National History Day project. So um, any other suggestions, um, throw them in the chat. I want to make sure um, in the interest of time, um, uh, we can come back to talking about maybe some barriers, but I would like to just show you um, there is a list in the agenda, and I'm going to put this again in the chat um, uh, for other places to find primary source sets, the Digital Public Library, um, Library of Congress, New York Public Library, Brooklyn Public Library, um, lots of places to find what it is that you are looking for. Uh, I really tried to limit myself in this project packet to what was in the Brooklyn collection. Um, and then um, the project packet should have already uh, gone to you in an email that you um, got when you registered, but I can surely send it again. Um, and all of these links um are available there the blog post that i wrote jen's written some great blog posts about teaching with primary sources um, and then i do want to share with you that there are plenty 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 of texts somebody wrote earlier that they um, wish that their kids knew that their students knew that you can do research in books still um, and so this is just a um handful of books that talk about the topics that were covered in this um, project packet but it it's really important to note that there are thousands of books in Sora if you are in the New York City Department of Education or Overdrive public library collections that are pairable with primary sources um, primary sources are an excellent way to introduce historical context into your curriculum um, and can be done in quick activities um, like what we did today. Uh, you don't have to do all 10 things. You can do one thing. Um, you could show the vaccination record activity that we did as a bell ringer just to talk about um, what's happening in current events. So it is 5.01. I want to be um, respectful of your time. Um, I think somebody will put the CTE. Yeah, link so in the sorry. Chat. 
I'm just going to interrupt and give the CTLE details. So Charlie, my colleague, has just put a link in the chat um, to a survey. That survey is your ticket to getting CTLE credit. Um, and so you can fill that out to give some feedback and also um, to, um, to give your info for one CTLE credit. Um, while you fill that in, we're also going to hang around if you have any additional questions. And I want to highlight some events that are coming up that you might be interested in registering for. Um, so we have a workshop on Thursday with friends from Greenwood Cemetery, uh, the buried history of Margaret Pine. Thinking about Women's History Month, thinking about how we do research on women and especially uh, enslaved women in Brooklyn, we'll be re-examining the narratives that have been told about Margaret Pine and using primary sources to um, critique and reconstruct that narrative. And then we're doing a workshop in April with friends from the Wyckoff House Museum on legacies of Dutch colonial Brooklyn and how we talk with our students about uh, those legacies, how we can be critical about those. Um, so again, that, that link to the survey is in the chat, um, and also I think some links to register for those. But um, thank you for being here with us today, and we will stick around for a few more minutes if you have any questions. Do we want to stop the recording for questions?